Good evening, Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to another edition of the MMB Live Show. I'm one of your hosts, Angela Green, Executive Director of On Location Memphis, and just want to welcome you to our, our live stream this evening. I know it's the 4th of July, so I know many people may be out, maybe catching this on the live stream, but we definitely couldn't let the first Monday of the month go by without coming in and talking and sharing with you some uh, industry news in the film and music industry as well as having a special guest with us tonight. We actually have television producer and screenwriter and fellow Memphian Ilanga Adele with us. He's gonna share with us his career as well as talk about some of the things he's going to be working with us in the coming months. And of course, I, as always, I have my co-host Christy Taylor back with me tonight. So anyway, hit the live, uh, hit this, hit the stream, the like button, share the stream, let everybody know that the MMB live show is about to begin right now. Hello, hello, hello. Happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. I am so happy you are back. I'm so happy to and be well. back. That's the reason why it's happy, you know, because now that we're all into Juneteenth, you know, 4th of July is just like, okay, another day just to hang out with yes. family and friends. But, uh, you know, I want to say I missed you last month. I know. I missed you as well. But, you know, Graham, he, he stepped right on there and pitched hit it and did an excellent job. So, always Yay. thankful to always have someone in the back pocket <laughs> to okay. step in. our ram in the bush well it's good to you know officially be here with you in summer and when i tell you summer it's sweltering looking at the weather coming I up i think we have three days here in memphis where it's going to be a hundred plus so i mean that's what we've been doing for the last it seemed like for the last couple of weeks yeah, it's been some nice, a couple of hundreds. So um, as we go into this first full week of July, it is summer, summer, summertime. And summertime in Memphis is always fun. Everybody knows that. So I'm now, looking you know forward to it. Um, you know, there's a joke that, you know, people have been celebrating the 4th of July with all these uh, fireworks. And then mm -hmm. some people are like, okay, enough already. It's like in the fireworks. But I think they're going to probably ride it the whole weekend. Right. I mean, they started Saturday over here where I live. So Ooh. we've been getting them every day. And uh, it's, it's, it's all right. We know what it is. We know what time it is. Well, as we go into our industry news, which I know I'm super excited about, there is a lot of fireworks at the box office. Oh, yeah. What we got? Okay. What we got? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm an I love animation. Let me let me mm -hmm. establish that. Um, I have to say that the minions, y'all know the minions. <laughs> they're back. I mean, they're the back like, they and go and then they come back. They go and then they, they come back. So yes, they're back. And, so of course, those who don't know, the minions, of course, are a hit. Um, and the rise of Gru. I I has lit up speaking about fireworks a record july 4th box office fireworks with check this out 125.2 million dollars i feel like okay. awesome powers when i say that <laughs> is that Did domestic you? only or is that worldwide domestically, domestically? To, oh wow yes. oh yeah and that's they, that's it that, they said that includes 107 million for the three day weekend. Of course, it's a four day weekend, but still, oh, yeah, and the that, gross that is awesome. That is amazing. So that's a record. Of course, you know I have to always shout out to Independence Day. Will Smith, you know he always was the Fourth of July king. Uh, but I mm -hmm. tell you, the millions, the millions have the taken millions. over. They've taken over the uh, <laughs> the crown, <laughs> and they've also taken over TikTok. Let me tell you what I mean by that. They said that. As a result of the minions, that there is a frenzy on TikTok where a lot of young males are dressing up as little group. Now, of course, when he gets older, he's more menacing and stuff like that. But they say they're coming to the theaters with the jacket and the scarf. <laughs> so they've okay. been kind of like, and it's a pretty much Generation Z. The Generation Z is okay. uh, Yeah, this holiday weekend yeah. they've been going. Yeah, and it's on TikTok. And if you want to check it out, it said go to hashtag gentle minions. Hashtag Gentle Minions, M-I-N-I-O-N-S on TikTok if you want to check out what I'm talking about. Um, the mm -hmm. other thing in the news, girl, now it hasn't even dropped, but we're already getting news about Avatar. Now, of mm -hmm. course, I think it's been like a decade since the first Avatar came out. James Cameron, yeah. who we know from Titanic and all these big 
you know, blockbuster films. And of course, he had to literally create technology to film this and waited till some additional technology before he continued to do the rest. And as we know, it's going to be a four part saga. So the first of four stories, of course, is already gone. Now, Avatar The Way of Water is going to be hitting theaters during the holiday weekend, not the 4th of July weekend, but the holiday weekend, December the 16th, just in time for Christmas. And it's already saying that there's a possibility that James Cameron may not direct the final Avatar films. Now, of course, really? for those who really yeah. watch what James Cameron does, he probably films a lot of his stuff at one time. So I think mm -hmm. he's doing story two and three back to back, but I don't know who could hmm. actually pull out four. Yeah, I've got, I'm surprised by that. I, I didn't think he would give that to anyone else, you know, to put that story in someone else's hands. I know. You know that's kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah, they hmm. said, um, yeah, they said that, okay, so let me read this. It says, Avatar The Way of Water hits theaters December the 16th. The third installment hasn't been announced, but it's slated to be released in 2024 since it was filmed back to back with Avatar 2. So two and three have already been shot, but the fourth and fifth movies haven't even gone into production yet. But yeah, there's a possibility that he won't be hmm. homing hmm. those. So I'm pretty, yeah. Kind of surprised by that. Now, yeah. what I'm not surprised about, and I think you said you've already watched it, is how well the movie Elvis did at the at at you know. First of all, mm -hmm. tell me about it. You said you watched it. Tell me what was oh, your yeah. thought. So I went to see it last night, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it was actually refreshing. It did come from a totally different perspective to a degree. You know, coming from Colonel Parker's um, perspective to a degree. The but, infamous um, Colonel Parker. The infamous <laughs> Colonel Parker. But um, but it really did uh, shed a new light. It really honed in on the relationship between Elvis Presley and the Black community and the influence of Black mm -hmm. music, blues, as well as gospel, how that impacted him as a as an artist and really helped to, sh to shape who he became as an artist. And so they really leaned into that, which I think it was kind of new. Um, for all you know, the but overdue. It was new, but overdue mm -hmm. because a lot of mm -hmm. people have had issues with Elvis, the story, or the I should say the the uh, the slant that they've always had because they never did lean into that truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. well, wow. What else? Tell me more. Let's see. The music was really good. They, I mean, the the original music as well as the the um, I guess you could say the remakes of it. You know, mm -hmm. the way they uh, combined. The, the uh, the rap elements or the R and B with the uh, the original blues and and rock or whatever so it was it was very very good so you know a couple of weeks ago they had a star studded screening of it at Grace right here in Memphis right here in Memphis um it was it was hush hush <laughs> so, yeah. speak, so people didn't really know about it until mm -hmm. afterwards but um all of the main I believe most of the main characters were there Austin. Uh, what's the gentleman's name who played Elvis? I think it's Austin. I can't think. Yeah, of his Austin name right Butler. Now. Butler. Austin he Butler. was in town. Uh, Tom mm -hmm. Hanks was in town. Of course, some of the family members: Priscilla Presley, I think Lisa Marie Presley, and uh, Jerry Schilling. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the yeah. granddaughter too. Yeah, the granddaughter and uh, Jerry Schilling, who's also a character in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so and of course, you know, many other Memphis. Uh, individuals here in Memphis who had ties to Elvis and you know a connection and and uh, so uh, from what I hear was it was an awesome red carpet event and um, and the one thing I did notice when I was listening to the interviews um, Priscilla Presley because it was a sanctioned event by the state and Priscilla Presley specifically said um, it's the truth wow. and, uh, and and it is a different truth than we have previously been told as far as Elvis's story, you know, that that relationship between him and uh, Colonel Parker, I don't think has ever been fully fleshed out. Mm. And so they really did that in this film. So it's, it's an excellent film. It's definitely. Wow. Excellent. You know, um, I got to give a shout out to Kenan Walker. He's one of the local Memphis um, actors here. Very it, uh, and Kenan, he he posted that he got a chance to be uh, a fly on the wall. So he got a chance to ah. attend. Yeah, Keenan. Yeah, 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 he's one of our rising stars. And if for those who know, he's also the duck master at yeah. the legendary Peabody Hotel. Now, right. speaking of Elvis, there's been a question in an article written was Austin Butler, who you say was in Memphis, the star of this movie. Uh, one of the questions was, was he really singing in the movie, uh, Elvis, or was he just mm -hmm. lip syncing? Well, there's actually a yes and a no. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they said the earlier songs was totally him. Mm -hmm. The later songs that had the more signature Elvis sound, they blended his voice. So oh, okay. he was singing, but there was that, you know, um, Elvis mixed in. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they said was an amazingly talented young man, uh, but the early years was strictly Austin. Yeah, and it was it was uncanny. I mean, especially wow. towards the latter years, mm -hmm. um, he looked just like Elvis. I mean, wow. it was uncanny how they did well, that. Oscar, too. would you say Oscar, yes or no? Oscar for the whole movie, Oscar for leading role, mm -hmm. you know, because Baz also over. I think, it, I think it's definitely Oscar worthy. I think the whole, I think the whole project, and I do think, you know, Mr. Uh, Butler. I think he's is definitely um, a contender. It's, worth a shot. it's a contender. It's definitely worth a shot. <clears throat> definitely. <sighs> Well, we will see what happens. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to end my Hollywood news, my <laughs> film news, with some really great news. Um, it may not be Oscar worthy yet, but there may be those who will rise out of this uh, partnership that will one day win Oscars. And this is something that was just announced. Okay, this is the 4th of July weekend. And for those who don't know, Essence, 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 mm -hmm. yes, uh, New Orleans. And Disney announced at Essence this weekend that they have launched a partnership with Howard University and they're going to create the Howard University Fund to support black storytellers. And this oh. is, check this out, Angela, they announced it's going to be a multi-year program mm -hmm. and it's entitled the Disney Storytellers Fund at Howard University, announced on yesterday at, El, um, at Essence Festival of Culture, that's what they're calling okay. it. Mm -hmm. And here's a bit specific. They said that the multi-year program will provide stipends over a five-year oh, period wow. for student projects focused mm -hmm. on storytelling across animation. Now, y'all know I love animation. Yeah. Uh, digital design, gaming, super geeked about that, journalism, live action, performing arts, product design, visual design, virtual reality, and more. So that means like as the industry expands, this will also expand. And it says also funding a new creative collaborative space at the university. Can you say new buildings? Can you say investing in probably state of the art equipment, yes. software? Yes. Um, and it will be able to um, provide access to speakers, mentors, internships to students in the program. So that means they're gonna get totally plugged into the Hollywood pipeline. So um, shout out to Howard University. Shout out Absolutely. to Disney. Absolutely, definitely yeah. for making that happen. Um, and that's a new destination for those, you know, students who are coming out of high school who who have a, uh, aspirations to be screenwriters or to be working the television mm -hmm. and film, Howard University, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a destination. That's somewhere to really consider thinking. Are they naming this after Chadwick? Because I, I remember they okay, were- Okay, I'm glad something. you brought this up because actually yeah. they're not naming the program. The program is going to be called the Disney Storytellers Fund. That means mm -hmm. the money at Howard. But Felicia Rashad, for those who don't know, she is the dean of the Chadwick A. Bozeman, I mean, Bozeman's College of Fine Arts at Howard. So they've already named- okay. The college, college. After him, okay. and Felicia okay. Richard is the dean. And of mm -hmm. course, this amazing partnership is definitely coming because they are stacking it very deep with deeply entrenched Hollywood uh, movies mm -hmm. and shakers. Uh, Felicia Richard, amazing. Totally mm -hmm. love her. And uh, mm -hmm. just to see how she's, you know, her alma mater and all that. And both in Chadwick also um, went there as well. So uh, the, I just had to end it with that. So for those who are from Memphis or you're watching this around the world, now reconsidered Howard University. And uh, right. shout out to those who have who are alum of this. I know they are super geeked and excited. Disney Storytellers Fun at Howard University. Howard well, University. that's my news. That's my yeah. news. Excellent. Right. Excellent news. Well, I just have a little bit of news. Actually, I'm piggybacking on what you just announced because we're looking at the Essence Music Festival which is always where you can find new and exciting things <laughs> going on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just noticed that on July 1st, I guess it was this past Friday, yeah. they had a surprise um, set by Wyclef, Gene, and Lauren Hill. They were the united. Got back together. The got back together <laughs> and, uh, and did a set at the uh, Essence uh, Music Festival. It was not, you know, it was not, uh, it was totally surprised. It was not no an announcement. It was okay. not announced or anything. No one knew that it was going. It was going to happen. Um, I think um, 
I think what it was is that Wyclef was performing. No, yeah, he was performing, but then, you know, just Lauren Hill just gotcha. kind of walked out, you know, and, oh, uh, and, did a and on time. <laughs> and yeah, right on time, you know, she was going to do her solo for Killing Me Softly, which, you know, everyone, that's one of my favorites yes. um, from back in the day, you know, mm. off of that album. And, um, but it's just kind of interesting how they just kind of, they kind of hit, hit and miss on it. But I didn't realize that they were initially planning a tour, a reunion tour, I think for this year. Wow. But they ended up um, canceling it because of the rise in the COVID-19 and, you know, making sure everybody's safe. So they haven't rescheduled it. Who knows? But, you know, we'll always love them whenever they decide to just yeah. kind of pop on in. And uh, they were testing the waters. They were probably testing the waters to see how people responded. So the promoters probably say, yeah, go and put them out on the road now. <laughs> I know. I, they know we're going to eat it up because, I mean, every single time it's like because it's so far and free between. I mean, they yes. don't they definitely don't wear it out so every decade we're, we're ready one decade, you know, one decade. we're ready for a reunion tour a real reunion tour and then um another thing is you know i'm planning on as many people are doing residencies and you know of course that was one of the the things in the elvis film the fact that he did that five-year las vegas residency at the uh what is the international casino there um when they first opened up so, you know, large stars doing that, that, it may have just kicked that whole situation off, you know, stars going to Las Vegas and uh, having those residencies for several weeks. And so I guess Adele was initially planning on doing a residency yeah. at Caesars Palace earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And she ended up canceling that residency oh, I um, because she's, you know, because of COVID-19 and wasn't ready and everything. But I guess recently she just felt the need to kind of speak on it again um, because, you know, just she got a lot of pushback, I guess, for, um, you know, canceling it. And so she felt the need to kind of, you know, just, you know, speak her um, piece, you know, as far, you know, just to let people know that, you know, she really was, you know, it really hurt her heart to have to cancel it. Cause I mean, I think she canceled it like the day before it was supposed to, to start or whatever, but, you know, she felt wow. like it wasn't ready, you know, that they really weren't ready. Um, and he, Usher said really, he kept on dancing. I think he kept his kept on going. Who, who was uh, who was that? Usher. Usher. He said, yeah, he's like, yeah, we. Gonna I'm gonna do my check. Y'all stay down there in the audience. We keep your mask on. Keep your, like, mask. Keep your mask on. We gonna keep. We gonna do the thing. So I'm looking forward because I'm gonna be going to you know John Legend is gonna have yes because he's been doing yes. I already right. have my ticket, baby. October I will yes. be in the house. Yes, in the house, yes. playing yes. Hollywood. So I'm come on now for that one. Mm -hmm. So that is that's pretty much the wrap of uh, the music news that I have. So we're going to take a quick break and right. we'll be right back with our special guest. Does your girlfriend know we're here? Um. Uh -huh. Yeah, she's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This system had one intention to put us in prison. It's just that simple. Kawaii TV. I love I that. Know. Every time we watch, play that, I know. Commercial, it never gets old. It. Never get so shout out to Deshauna Spencer, the creator of Quayley TV, a Memphis native hanging Memphis out. Native. We're, gonna call her. We're gonna say she's just hanging out on the East Coast, but yeah, that's home now. Um, but yes. you know, she just did an amazing um campaign, and I understand, of course, we had a chance to have her in the all tour club. Absolutely. And she gave us some great information on how Memphis filmmakers can get plugged into the new things that she's doing with Quayley. So content creators, um, be sure to join the Altier Club and check out that. Check uh, out the video out. and reach out to her because she does have a profile in the Altier Club that goes directly to her. So you can definitely mm -hmm. reach out, let her know you are a member and you're interested in uh, seeing how you can connect. Absolutely. So I'm very excited um to bring this person to the virtual stage he's actually um an old friend of our family um his mother and my aunt uh were good friends and he actually grew up with my cousin uh anthony and um and so he's sort of he's sort of like family 
to us. And um, and I remember as a child, him, you know, the we, you know, we're sitting here watching television, and we, you know, every time we watch Good Times or I mean uh, Sanford and Son, we have to wait to see the the credits to see <laughs> if if this was written by uh, Elonga Adele. You know, they say that's. You know that's Miss Stevenson's son. You have to we have to go see if the, if he wrote this episode. You know, and so I remember as a child them telling us this, and so I'm just so happy that he uh, took some time out on this holiday weekend to come share with us. So Elonga Adele, fellow Memphian, he's American television and film producer and screenwriter as well as an actor. He's written for many television series, primarily sitcoms such as Sanford and Son, Two Two Seven, A Different World. Married with Children, Rock, Moesha, just to name a few. Um, he is back in Memphis, and he has uh, produced a short film and doing other writing still. So we're looking forward to him sharing with us um, all that, you know, his career and all that he has going on. So I'm welcoming to the uh, virtual stage, Mr. Adele. How you doing? Woo, 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 woo. And he so had to come so very good. Thin. So and far, so good, ladies. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, I, I'm super excited because I'm going to be um, trying to get all up in your business. Uh, but, but Angela, so what, was it, so what was it like growing up with, you know, knowing him? And what were some of those experiences? It was just, I mean, it was, it was, uh, that's really more of a question for Anthony because I was, you know, I was just a baby and he was already well off into Hollywood by the time I came along. But, you know, Aunt Dorothy was very proud of him. And uh, and so she would always, you know, brag on him to my mom and our family. And like I said, we just, you know, we just always knew the shows that he worked on. And so that was just one of the things that they would tell us, you know, you know, I, I, Mrs. Stevenson's son is a writer out in Hollywood. And, you know, and he, he probably he may have wrote this episode, you know, that sort of thing. And so I just remember that. That was one of the things that I just remember growing up. And then I actually had an opportunity once I moved to Memphis and he moved back to Memphis, we had the opportunity to actually meet face to face um, at that time. So that's kind of my my memories growing up. Yeah, that's 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 legendary. So um, welcome. Welcome back at you. How are you doing? <laughs> We're good. We're good. We're good. I guess I just want to know, how did you get started? Because are you Memphis born and raised? Bred and born, Hamilton High School, class of 1966. You know something? That's a true Memphian. Y'all don't understand. A true Memphian knows to go ahead and tell you the high school, the year, the community. They already know. They already know. <laughs> That's right, baby. So, how did you, that. so tell me... From Hamilton to Hollywood, you got to give me, because I'm, I'm just now getting to know you. So how did you go from Hamilton to Hollywood? Well, I made a little short uh, side trip to Connecticut to go to college, mm -hmm. a school called Wesleyan. I went there for two years. And then from there, I went to the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And that is actually where I entered the theater, was at the theater company of Boston. My my roommate, uh, who was a Bostonian, had an uncle who was an actor at um, Theater Company of Boston. He was one of like two black actors who were at the Theater Company of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were walking by the theater one day, going home, and he says, my uncle works in there. He's an actor. I said, well, I could do that. And he said, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So we go in there one day, and I'd never been in a theater before, and it was like the stereotypical scene in the movie where you hear the angelic choir in the background and the voices it was like and theaters are dark on monday you know nothing going on just a few right. stage lights on i'm like ha ha this is where i belong i found myself i'm no longer meandering through life right and wow. it just felt right and, and it being in the theater it, it all just came over me like a disease wow but, I knew that's where I belonged. I knew that's where I belonged. And then uh, from there, um, I went to New York and auditioned for a play called, uh, off-Broadway play called Five on the Black Hand Side, mm. which, which, which was eventually made into a movie. Yeah, I was gonna say, that sounded mm. so familiar. Mm. That I wasn't in. <laughs> okay, so you weren't the, you you didn't go from stage to screen. <laughs> Not no, that no, no, no. <laughs> but that you know, I, the role that I originated off off uh, Broadway, 
was performed in the movie by a wonderful actor named Glenn Turman. <gasps> Stop it. Yeah. So the young Glenn Turner. Yeah, we were all young then. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. We were all and uh there were some wonderful actors in that um in the movie and in the play. The woman who played my mother in the play was a lady named Clarice Taylor. And she ended up playing Bill Cosby's mother on his show years <gasps> later. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there's another lady in there named Teresa Merritt. Mm -hmm. And she ended up being the the mama in a TV show starring Clifton Davis called uh, That's My Mama. I remember that show too. I do. Yeah. Oh, now, you, now you're talking. You're yeah. talking the good but, 70s, but, early 80s. Good. Oh, like yeah. But, but now I'm in, I'm in New York. I'm in a theater mm -hmm. and I joined a, a black theater troupe called the Black Magicians. Oh. And we were the kind of like the minor league team for uh, the New Lafayette Theater Company, which was mm -hmm. a wonderful theater company in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, that's where I met Whitman Mayo. Was he was in New Life? He who played mm -hmm. Grady on Sanford and Son. Whitman Mayo played Grady on Sanford and Son. Mm -hmm. But I knew Whitman in New York. You know, Doing stage work before I even went to Los Angeles. Before, mm -hmm. even. and Damon Wilson, who played Lamont on Sanford and Son, mm -hmm. was actually in the play Five on the Black Hand Side. Wow. Yeah. So I knew him before I even went to um, Los Angeles. Coincidentally, Five on the Black Hand Side was written by uh, Charlie Russell, playwright Charlie Russell. Charlie mm -hmm. Russell has a brother who, mm -hmm. is a, who is a renowned basketball player named Bill Russell. Oh, my okay. goodness. You, you're just connecting all the dots. Okay. Yeah. And the Legendary. Way I, the way um, I got from the theater to Sanford and Son, I had a one-act play. And I, I consider myself an actor who wrote. Understood. Mm -hmm. So I had a one act play that was at the public theater in New mm -hmm. York. Now, the public okay. theater is a big deal. Yes, yeah, a real big deal <laughs> to this at, day. At, at that time, it was becoming a big deal. Mm -hmm. wow. And the man who founded the public theater, Joe Papp, had mm -hmm. a publicity machine just working, working overtime. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you might be at rehearsal and there are photo photographers from Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, all these magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and he had playwrights who had had plays done in his theater in recent history, shot kind of like a police lineup. And um, there were playwrights like uh, Jason Miller, mm -hmm. who wrote, I think he Jason wrote Championship Season, but he, um, mm -hmm. most of you guys have probably seen a movie called The Exorcist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jason Miller played the young priest in The Exorcist. Wow. <laughs> but he was also, you know, an actor in the public theater. Okay. I remember my a friend of mine, Waleek and I, we were walking down probably like Fifth Avenue or Sixth Avenue in New York one day. Jason comes out of this big building with this script. And mm -hmm. he said, I just auditioned for this movie. And he shows us his script, The Exorcist. Wow. I, never, I had never heard of The Exorcist, mm -mm. but my friend had. He said, "Oh, that's the movie. That's that's the story about the little girl, isn't it?" He said, "Yeah," but you know, I, yeah, obviously the, the movie made uh, movie history. Oh, yeah, movie now, history. One of, other, one of the other playwrights who had Joe Papp had us photograph with was a guy named uh, David Rave, and he, he he wrote plays like Streamers and Sticks and Bones, mm -hmm. which were. Mm -hmm. Highly regarded, uh, yeah, sticks and bones. I think I plays. and yeah. it was now. I just got a little one act play <laughs> mm -hmm. on a bill with four other one act plays. And what was your play about? My play was about it was about uh 30 minutes long, it was about 30 minutes long. But it what was, was the a, subject title. I knew you were going to get to that. Yes, sir. I'm trying to. I'm trying to pick your brain. I'm not. I know I'm taking you back. I know I'm taking you way back. I want to take you back. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was it was a two two character play, mm -hmm. um, and it was about a guy kind of loosely based on Malcolm X mm -hmm. and his wife, and how she wanted him to get out of the uh, stop being an activist, you know, mm -hmm. because it was dangerous, and she just wanted a normal life. 
two character mm -hmm. one act play oh i should probably mention this the male lead in the play was a guy named morgan freeman no what no no and, and no and and i was a director of that play the morgan what? freeman performed in your play off broadway yeah I, used to, I get i got to crack the whip on his butt <laughs> So oh, no, no Morgan, back up. Me. Let's say the lines this time. Come on, come on. Oh my God. Now, he, wow. that would have been early 70s, so he was still definitely theater and Sesame Street and doing, all that kind of Yeah, he was doing Sesame Street and theater. He was doing a lot of theater. He was uh, a little while after that, either before or after that, I can't remember. He replaced an actor named Cleavon Little on Broadway in a play called Pearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. After doing your, who was the female lead in your play? Do you remember her? Yeah, she was my girlfriend. <laughs> well, you should remember her. <laughs> she was a, she was an, she was an older woman. She was my first adult relationship. She was like nine years older than me. She cougared me up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, it's your life story. You can tell it how you want hey. to. Okay. Hey. You know, some of y'all be blaming the cougars. I think it's the pups that be trying to happen. Okay, anyway. You know, right. If I got a cougar now, she'd have to be 90 years old. But that's <laughs> uh her name uh is Novella Nelson. Okay. And she's done television okay. and movies. She recent she's recently deceased, but uh she's done a lot of stuff. Mm. A lot of stuff. Uh, so he so the, your your off Broadway play that starred Morgan Freeman and your girl cougar girlfriend. Um <laughs> Oh. Actually, actually gave you an opportunity to be, segue to Hollywood. How did that happen? What was the relationship? Because, what happened? Cut to cut to Hollywood. The producer of Sanford and Son, mm -hmm. a man named Aaron Rubin, is getting a lot of flack because he's not employing any black writers. Ooh, okay. okay. So, yes. but Aaron Rubin, bless his soul. <laughs> reads reads the new york sunday times religiously okay and he happens to see this this police lineup photo of, of myself and these other playwrights was myself <laughs> another black playwright named oyama and you know, all these other white playwrights he looks at us and says well if they wrote for pap maybe they can write for us oh i gotcha so you know he reached out and uh they snatched the eventually, you know, I, you know, I left uh, New York to move to Hollywood to become a, a, a television writer. Wow. wow. Okay. So for those who, who don't know, I mean, first of all, you know, theater is my first love when it comes to all of this. Broadway was my truest ambition. A lot of people don't know that I end up having a career in radio, but Broadway, that was yeah, always my greatest ambition. Um, so when it comes to segueing from theater to television back in the day it was a little bit easier than it is today correct no no okay well give me the full truth well you know look at all the outlets you have today how many channels are there how many black, there, how many how many black shows are there on now yeah, yeah. you know it was um uh, for instance aaron rubin is saying i can't find any black writers in hollywood I, which is like saying I can't find a fish in the ocean. Ooh. When I when I go from New York to Hollywood, I meet a lot of black writers. Understood. A lot. There was no access. Mm. There was no access. Mm -hmm. was no so access. you come in, new kid on the block, you know, passing up those who've been standing in those Hollywood lines. Um, so how did you build a relationship with the other black actors in the black film community um, back at that time? Well, cons consider the culture that I came out of, mm -hmm. which was, this is 1972, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the tail end of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Black power mm -hmm. is happening. Black is mm -hmm. beautiful. Nation time. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a cultural nationalist. All of this is, you know, at its height. I'm coming out of a theater environment where we were like, family understood mm -hmm. we call each other brother and sister understood wasn't all this n-word and b-word no so you, if you if, if you call the woman a b-word 
somebody would have took you off to the side and had a talk with you about that. Understood. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I went from New York to Los Angeles, it actually was a little bit of culture shock because it was it, there was an everybody for themselves mentality. It's probably still going mm -hmm. on. And right. so in, ter in terms of me connecting with other people, easy. Because to mm -hmm. me, you're in the family. Yeah. We're in it together. If I can help you, I'll help you. In New York, when I was an actor, we used to tell each other about auditions. Wow. You know, you need to check this out. You need to go over the audition for that. Mm -hmm. When I got to L.A., I found out actors did not tell other actors about auditions until they were sure that they were not going to get the part. Right. Then wow. they, would, they would tell you. But by the end, this is a little late in the game. Right. Wow. It's, a little, it's a little late in the game. Me, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, you know, meet, greet, talk, and, you know, and be with other black people. I did. Because I, that's that was just your MO. First yeah, of all, coming from the I South. My, I have to mention my yeah. mentor. Yeah. My mm -hmm. mentor, a man named Ellis Hazlett. Mm -hmm. And he had a show on TV called Soul and had an ex exclamation point out of it. After mm -hmm. and it, and it actually his niece actually did a couple of years ago a short movie called Mr. Soul, which uh was which was uh you know documented him and documented the show. Mm -hmm. But Ellis was to this day the best person I know. Mm -hmm. He helped everybody he could. Mm -hmm. He helped everybody he could, and he inspired me to be the same mm -hmm. way. He was mm -hmm. just a good person, a good man. Mm -hmm. who helped everybody. I, I believe mm -hmm. in helping people. So if I can. How did that impact you? Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering if you were the only black in the writing room when they plucked you to write for Sanford and Son? Sanford and Son, there was no writing room. Okay. There was no writing staff. Hmm. Mm. Most, it, was, it, was, it was highly unusual. I didn't know it was highly unusual, but it was highly unusual. Hmm. Uh, most of the scripts were written by freelance writers. What? Yeah, hmm. there was a producer. Yeah, there was a producer, Aaron hmm. Rubin, myself. I was on staff as a story editor. And then kind of late in the game, for a little while, there was another guy, a white guy named Gene Farmer. But there wasn't like a, you know, a writing staff. Right. Okay, very quickly, um, you know, because I have been trying to, because uh, I'm a produced screenwriter. I mean, I've been in theater. I, you know, I can say I'm a produced playwright. I've never done like a lot, you know, college now. You've, you've had the experience. I've had, yes, I've had the experience of staging and directing some work, um, particularly when I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But I've always been very confused by tv writers in the pecking order because like you said you were a writer you're a playwright you're a produced playwright and now you're being brought in to be a writer but you say the term story editor so just educate me you know what it, give me because it's not a writing room but give me the help me understand the whole tv writing uh, pecking order well it definitely is a pecking order you know you start off with the quote show runner right okay yeah, they I'm probably don't that. have the title executive producer, mm -hmm. but if you look at TV shows now, like you Shonda might see, Rhimes, right? Yeah, but you might see five, six, seven executive producers. Okay, right. One of them is the showrunner. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so one of the, you know the head honcho. Mm -hmm. uh, in descending order, you would go story editor. Excuse me, executive producer. Co then next, the low below them would be like a co-exec producer. Okay. Then you might have a supervising producer. Mm. You might have a coordinating producer. And then finally you get down to just plain producer. Mm -hmm. And then story editor is actually the entry level. Okay. Most of these uh, producers that, that are listed on, in the credits are writers. Okay. It's kind of like the army, you know, where everybody is a soldier. Yes. But you know, you just got different ranks. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of it, 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 it's like that. Okay. Most uh, and the and the what the reason why you have so many executive producers on TV shows now is because, generally speaking, you get promoted, you get a bump in title, 
and you get a bump in salary if you okay. stick around. Okay. So eventually you're going to get up to executive producer. Mm. Just, you know, just because you were there several years. If okay, so there. 1972, so you're there. You, you, you are now a TV writer, a veteran TV writer. I mean, of course, by the time you, you know, I mean, the credits are amazing. Please look them up, ladies and gentlemen. Pay between when you start and pay as you saw it changing, because now we hear the TV writers get like millions of dollars per episode. Yeah. So 72, where were people? It was just almost like still the golden age of studios where they, it was a similar line or were they starting to get into the salaries you know, that were like six and seven figures? Depending on who you were. But okay. the salaries compared to, it was 1972, the salaries compared. Was that fifty years ago? The salaries compared to you know the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, mm. consider this. I'm at the public theater. I've written a play. I'm directing Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yes. And I'm acting in a. I'm also acting in another play. I'm. I'm I got three jobs at the public theater in 1972. Mm -hmm. I am making 150 dollars a week. Oh wow! Yeah, but to me, I'm. Now my rent, the rent was fifty dollars. Okay. So I, I, I'm loaning people money. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, you're doing good. You're doing I'm very well. <laughs> what they would say, heck of good. But right. when I go to Los Angeles just to talk to them about writing for Sanford and Son, my agent has gotten me a two picture, a, a two script deal before I even get on the plane. Okay. Oh, wow. They got to pay me for two scripts, whether they like them or not oh, they wow. fly me out first class they put me in a universal sheraton mm -hmm. they give me a car they give me a hundred dollars a day expense account wow for five days they give me a hundred dollars a day this is your money here yes so yeah now the scripts i forget how much they were you know a couple two two or three thousand dollars uh for a script a tv script then mm -hmm. you know it's like 10 times that much now right but uh consider going from 150 dollars a week three Honey, i'm already three there I'm, I'm just realized yeah. that you yeah. have a hundred dollars a day yeah, yeah. right so basically yeah six hundred dollars is now five hundred dollars a week so you're already yeah. at two thousand dollars so down, yeah. so yeah. and not counting the the stay the car yeah yourself yeah i i see i see yeah and they actually um offered me the first year the first year of san francisco i wrote five scripts for that show wow um was it the 22 no, not the first year the first year I wrote, hmm? was it the 22 episodes back then yeah yeah oh. well, something like that but i did five mm -hmm. and they they offered me a job so come out here and be a story editor but once again, yeah. I, what am I thinking? I am an actor who writes. Right. I knew they were going to make Five on the Blackhead side into a movie. Right. I'm thinking, no, I'm going to be in this movie. I'm an actor who writes. So I turned down that offer. <gasps> when, but then, no, I did. But I didn't. Get, but I didn't get the gig in Five on the Blackhead side. Right. Coincidentally, the, you know, they make me another offer to come out. More money. More money. Okay. Let's <laughs> say. So they need you. They Maybe got you hanging, tapping on my shoulder. They need something, so I go. Mm -hmm. I go. Wow. How I long did you stay with San Francisco? I am a child of the theater. Understood. That's I understand, I understand totally yeah. what you're saying because mm -hmm. I understand totally. Yeah. How many episodes? I mean, how many years did you stay with San Francisco? And, and who? What studio was? Um, it, it was NBC. NBC. Okay. Yeah. Uh, basically, two two seasons. Okay. One from New York, one from LA, and then you know, it, you know, you you out scrambling trying to um, get some other shows, get some other gigs, and I was fortunate uh, that I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. but you know, so we're talking else. by the mid seventies. You totally understand the LA way, and what are you finding? How do you navigate it personally? Because you said it is a, it is a different animal. Very different. Um, yeah. A lot of, fortunately, a lot of my friends from New York 
also made that migration around that time also. Okay. okay. I had a I have a friend, he's, uh, his name is Chris Kaiser. And um, he was an associate producer on at least three or four Sidney Poitier movies. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, like Uptown Saturday Night, Let's Do It Again, some more, some more. Actually, I have a small uh, role, one of those don't blink roles because you won't see me, roles <laughs> in uh, Let's Do It Again. Because uh, my friend Chris Kaiser, who had played a similar role in Uptown Saturday Night, did not want to re did not want to repeat doing a small role, so he threw it to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I had other friends who came out who I knew in New York who came out like Whitman Mayo played Grady on mm -hmm. Seraph and the Sun. I knew him in New York. Son another actor, Sonny Jim Gaines. Um, if if you see see his face, you'll know who he is. Mm -hmm. He's no longer with us, but you you'd recognize him. A lot of people um, came out, and then you then you meet people. Right. Also, mm -hmm. you know while you're there, uh, you know some of them are good. You know the, the ones that aren't, you weed out. Right. Mm -hmm. You weed out. So you kind of settled into the writer's position, yes. even though you're an actor who writes. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so how did you, you know, get on to, you know, 227 and different, the other shows that you ended up writing for? Were you uh, each, each show is kind of like a different story. Okay. 227. Uh, uh, well, how did that happen? Um, I was actually talking to Marla Gibbs on the phone. Mm -hmm. I forget who put us in contact. Uh, but she was having a trouble because most of the writers on 227 were white they weren't black they were white mm -hmm. um and she wanted me to come aboard and write mm -hmm. Co coincidentally jack hay mm -hmm. who played on 227 i knew her in new york before mm. um she came to, to hollywood she was actually the friend of my other girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> And well, yeah, I, you know, Jack A was just like to me, like a little, little girl. Because I think when I met Jack A, she was probably seventeen. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the time I'd come to uh, Los Angeles, I didn't even know she had been acting wow. at all until you know she shows up. I, I don't. I don't think she was the one that put me in touch with Marla. Anyway, I'm talking to Marla, and she's trying to get in, in, in and she wants me to come aboard as a writer on a show. Mm -hmm. And um, she goes to the exec producers and say, hire this writer. Mm -hmm. And they tell her, well, we don't have any more money. We cannot hire any more writers. The budget is, the writing budget is shot. And so she tells me that I said, okay. The executive producers then hire a white writer, one of their <laughs> friends. Ooh. <laughs> exactly. Ooh. Uh -oh. Marla's gonna get you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which she did. Oh, here's another little Marla had aside from being the star of 227, mm -hmm. she had a lot more power. Yes. Mm -hmm. also. Why? Because mm -hmm. the the NBC exec bequeathed her that power. Yes. Mm -hmm. when, when, when she found out they had hired this uh, this white writer mm -hmm. after they told her they didn't have no more writing but uh, writer. Mm -hmm. Writing money in the budget, she went off, mm -hmm. and they hurried up and hired my butt. Wow! <laughs> they hurried up and hired my butt. So that was a unique situation. Mm. How long uh, did you wait for them? How many seasons? It was like three, three seasons. Oh, that's a good. That's nice. That's yeah, nice. That was a nice little run. Yeah, and mm. the checks are getting bigger because you know we're getting. Oh yeah, the checks are getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so how does how do you feel tv change because you're talking to during the time when there were quite a few black shows uh family oriented black shows and then there was a lull and then of course there's a resurgence in the 90s so how did where did you find yourself doing the lull well you know you like everybody else you know you trying to get a gig somewhere mm -hmm. you know you write your quote spec scripts mm -hmm. and you submit them mm -hmm. And, you know, I was able to get some other uh, 
um, you know, freelance work, you know, married. Well, you with stayed girl. working. So you, you were, you were fortunate. You stayed working. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was dedicated to it. So now, you know, and you- I, you know, a couple of, uh, development deals in terms of writing screenplays that, that were not produced, but you know, you get paid for, it. Right. Mm-hmm. even remember working with, uh, on a TV show with Debbie Allen, Felicia Richard's sister. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that never got uh, made, never got produced. Mm-hmm. But it was a pay or play deal. Mm-hmm. So uh, we we still got to get paid, you know, for all the work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, as a writer for a different world, did you work? You did you ever have an opportunity to work with Bill Cosby? No, no, no. But I had encountered him before like mm-hmm. when, initially when i first moved mm-hmm. to uh los angeles and did uh let's do it again he was acting in it yes exactly and he, he actually uh gave me a cigar mm-hmm. I, said, I don't know what but you know I, I it was so strong i smoked it and threw up Ooh. <laughs> yeah uh mm-hmm. And I had seen him kind of socially. Mm-hmm. Why? Because my cougar girlfriend was friends with an actor named Clarence William the Third, who was on My Squad. Yes. And his wife Gloria Foster, who's a terrific actor. Mm-hmm. And Bill Cosby and mm-hmm. C.W. Clarence William the Third knew each other. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I saw him a few times. I remember seeing him one time uh, at the public, at uh, the public theater done like Shakespeare in the park. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, we went over there, you know, to, to see, I think it was the Pirates of Penzance, but, you know, Cosby was there and mm-hmm. he had come with this huge picnic basket. <laughs> oh. what, did, what was in it? Tell us what was in it. It was the size of a one bedroom New York apartment. This this. <laughs> all kind of stuff, you know. It was the first time I seen a picnic basket that had, you know, uh dishes and glasses and stuff. Oh wow. You know, aside from the food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he was a uh I would say conversation dominator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His personality, yeah. yeah. Of course he, he wasn't he wasn't the Cosby we knew just like with Marla and all them they were building their clout they were building their legacy yeah. um, so you were there when they are building and uh, oh, he was, uh, Cosby was a star by the time I yeah, he, he was, was a star, star. Yeah, he was a star but he wasn't a he hadn't inked the deal with Con, with the Cosby show in different world yet correct no but he had done I Spy he had done yes other, yes uh, mm-hmm. he was yes. a star yeah, he was definitely mm-hmm. Diane Carroll and the whole nine yards, that family, yeah, and that, that, that generation of actors. And wow. Sidney Poitier definitely was a star. Oh, yeah. He was oh, yeah. Bel and Sid- and he, he kind of, I don't I wouldn't say he hated me, but <laughs> Who? which one? I kind of Mr. Portier. I kind of PO'd him, pissed him off a little bit one time. A couple of times. <laughs> oh wow. You know, it's hey, boring. it happens. It happens. We're all, you know, human. We yeah. rub, we rub yeah. people the wrong way. So when did you realize that, okay, between t- TV writing, also film writing, did you ever have anything produced for film? No, I've been paid. To, we did do a short film. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Angela's scene. It's called Avenging mm-hmm. Angel. And we mm-hmm. are actively um, seeking finances to make the feature version. So. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. When did you start transitioning out of television writing and, you know, and more importantly, back to cross the Mississippi? I came back here um, to caretake my mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, when was that? At least 10 years ago, maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago mm-hmm. to caretake my mother. And she uh, died in 2016. Understood. Mm-hmm. So she made a transition, but you know, uh, watching that process taught me one thing that I already knew, but it really living, living it is different. Mm-hmm. Death is a natural part of the life cycle. Yeah. 
You know, I don't think the, the creators, mm -hmm. God did not create anything just to cause us pain. Correct. Mm -hmm. You know, death in and of itself is not a tragedy. Mm -hmm. We just to say you, you can die tragically. You know, you could mm -hmm. be murdered or car mm -hmm. wreck or, mm -hmm. you know, or some horrible disease. But death in and of itself, it, I know it's a transition to the next phase of existence. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I moved back here to caretake my mom. And but when I visit L.A. now, I, I don't want to live there anymore. It's, it's mm -hmm. just too big. The mm -hmm. traffic was bad when I was there. It is an utter beast. The traffic is a freaking yeah. beast. I go mm -hmm. out there, people are, you know, say, hey, man, come over here. I get invited to some stuff. I don't know. No, no. <laughs> no it's, it, it's going to take me 25 minutes just to get out the parking lot. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have two yeah. daughters. Yeah. Two adult daughters who do live in Los Angeles. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to go back from time to time, but it's like, woo. So glad I don't live here anymore. So yeah. as how okay, the industry has changed. You can technically write from anywhere in the world, yeah. even a cabin on the backside mm -hmm. of the desert. <laughs> so yeah. uh, as long as yeah. you have strong Wi-Fi. Um, yeah. So how have you over the last decade remained connected to the industry, and in what ways are you looking to do it in the future? I'm re really looking, and I'm I'm partnered with. Uh, other people it's not just you know my effort i'm partnering with other people you know who, who are trying to get you know tv done i really want to tell, do movies to be honest with you okay. i really want to do movies like i said we made a short we are actively seeking funds to to, to make the feature mm -hmm. um and waiting to hear back from some people mm -hmm. about that but in terms of like you know you got zoom you got yeah. access to anybody all over the world. I was talking to yeah. a writer um, who he, he, he's currently working in Hollywood, but he was describing the the virtual writing room. Wow. You know, the, the writers meet like we're meeting right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meeting like mm -hmm. you, it's, you know, it, it goes on, it's still happening. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, I would be interested in maybe on location Memphis through the All Tour Club can have you even uh, do a special like this month uh, for the mm -hmm. All Tour Club. I'm going to be talking about script writing, uh, but I, I definitely would love to have an opportunity to pick your brain a little bit deeper and more uh, along the lines of the craft, <laughs> the craft of mm -hmm. TV writing and mm -hmm. uh, how to remain relevant even when we're not in New York or L.A., not um, not a problem. I should yeah. also men men mention that I do mentor to uh, some young writers. I do. Okay. Absolutely. Well, we we definitely would welcome them into the Artur Club. Yeah. Elanga is already in the uh, Artur Club. And, yeah. What uh, I'm saying is have a special presentation mm -hmm. with them. With them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that'd yeah. be awesome. I need to jump in. Invite me to the TV writing. I mean, to whatever club you all in virtually. I I just want to be in the room. I just need to feel connected. So. Okay, I have a, a, a one of my uh, proteges works at the uh, Los Angeles Film School, and he oh. was actually had a a, a writer's room uh, forum that we were doing. Um, and he may he may start it back, and if he does, I'll let you know. Thank you. I'll let you know. So, Ilonga, do you have a few minutes to stay on with us as we go through the next segment? You talk me into it. <laughs> <laughs> For those who want to can stay connected to you, how can they, you know, stay hooked up to all that you are doing and, and possibly even be mentored by you or take some um, of your I am, I am at everybody's beck and call. Once again, I believe in helping people. If I can help you, I will. Mm -hmm. I know Angela has my contact information and Angela, feel free to share it with Christy Taylor. Well, definitely. And then also know that he is connected to the tour club. So if you come into the tour club as a member, you can find him there and you can shoot him a message directly and he yeah. will get that. So, all right. So we're going to take a quick break and then we will be back for our next segment.
we're back. And we're back. All right. So we our next segment is the uh, MMB track of the month. And uh, what we're going to do along is we are going to uh, introduce one of our publishers and we're going to play one of his tracks. And while we're listening to the track, just be thinking about how you would envision that track being used in mm. a uh, visual or you know media project, either film, TV, or whatever. But our um, publisher this uh, this month is Jamil Bryson, yeah. and uh, he is a uh, Memphian, and th- his song that we're going to listen to is called Fab Five. Thinking, Christy. You know, maybe because I've been watching quite a few uh, heist movies, action movies, you know, those skyfall type movies. This sounds like a great um, movie when the movie is starting and the and the and the trailer is coming on, you know, the, all the prelude, the title, mm-hmm. the cast and the characters, and it's like the animation, almost like some Mission Impossible movies. That's what it's talking about. The opening. The opening, yeah. So a really great heist or action movie. That has something that mm-hmm. like it. Just put me in mind of that. What about you? What do you think? What about you, Alonga? Yeah, something similar. I, I'm seeing uh, somebody getting ready to do something. Like some, somebody has a serious task in mind. Like they're getting ready to confront somebody or fight somebody and they are approaching them and they're getting their mind ready for that confrontation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that as well. And they're confident. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. I just saw an assassin movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. that kind of, you know, high caliber. It's definitely because it is, it is in the smooth jazz category. It's mm-hmm. an opportunity to also kind of stretch it, even if you had a, maybe a dinner scene, you know, mm-hmm. a five star restaurant, you know, like a Cena Royale. I mean, I just, I just feel that kind of it's definitely uh, an A plus movie type. Right, movie. Mission Impossible, um, yeah. 007. You yeah. know, you just kind of, mm-hmm. you kind of get that feeling mm-hmm. from this track. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. This track is available. It's available for purchase right now at the Memphis Music Bank. Just look up Jamil Bryson, five five. He has several other tracks in the bank. And that is the MMB track for the month of July. Five five. Yeah, there's, right. there's a lot of uh, music there. When I say a lot of music, you know, a, a lot of different tones. Yes. A lot of different instruments. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the will evoke emotions. Mm-hmm. He, he, he or he's got some. Uh, some skills definitely yeah yeah he's 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 one of the top ones we have definitely Mm -hmm. he's going to be one of the composers in the mmb mixer competition this month um alonga is going to be one of our judges so you'll be able to see a little bit more from jamil um when we have that competition in the latter part of the month but Mm -hmm. uh that's jamil bryson and for those of you all who are not familiar with the Memphis Music Bank, um, I'm going to 
show this quick commercial to give you a little bit more information. That's Memphis Music Bank. That's B-A-N-Q.com. Um, if you're looking for your next soundtrack, be sure to give us a listen. Um, we also do have composers who can do custom content. So if you go to the bank and you don't hear exactly what you're looking for, still reach out. We um, could possibly reach out to one of our composers who might can do something specifically for you. And again, as always, our motto is quality content that's legally sound and reasonably priced. So uh, I guess, um, well, what we'll, we'll we have coming up for in our tour club? We got wow. July 18th is yes, going we to do. be the live stream. And oh. um, yours truly, Christy yeah. Taylor, is going to be the guest. From the strip with the script polisher. The He's script polishers. Script. Yes, I'm going to be um, more so kind of like um, for those who are in the I like the brainstorming, the ideation of screenwriting. So for those who may want to uh, have a session on how to really come up with a great story idea, um, some basic things. I like the character development aspect of, of writing. And uh, so we'll be talking about that. And if somebody has an idea and just kind of want to, uh, as you can say, break the story. Hey, mm. come hang out with us and we'll do that. We'll just play around with storyline and flip that script and see how yeah, come, come absolutely. Great ideas. So that's going to be July 18th at 7 mm -hmm. o'clock p.m. inside of the tour club. So if you are not a member of the tour club, go to onlocationmemphis.org and click the uh, tour club and submit your request for uh, request to join. Check your eligibility to join as either a music producer filmmaker or uh, industry professional. So just check that out. And uh, Ilanga, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight. I appreciate you giving us some of your time on this 4th yes. of July holiday. My pleasure. And we look forward to definitely uh, having you in our tour club and back on the uh, the stream again real soon. So you uh, not going anywhere. I talked you into it. <laughs> Yay. So I guess this wraps up wraps up another edition of the MMB live show for the month of July. And we just, uh, we thank you all for joining us. Those who are watching live and those who will watch the replay and we will see you all next month.